Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. Welcome to those who are here in the meeting house, those who are in the church hall, and those joining on the internet service at home. Thank you to each and all of you for joining us for worship, and may the Lord bless you and bless each one of us as together we worship him. At 6.30 p.m. this evening, the evening service will take place by Zoom. Would members of the Congregational Committee um, please note that on Tuesday night at um, 7.30 p.m., the committee uh, members decided that a uh, general cleanup of the church premises would take place. So I'm reminding all members of the Congregational Committee of that. Come along Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. to help with that. And also any other members of the congregation who would like to um, help as well are most welcome to join us Tuesday at 7.30. On Wednesday at 7.15 p.m., the prayer meeting will take place by Zoom. As I said last week, we're alternating week about. So this Wednesday, Zoom prayer meeting at 7.15 p.m. Then on Friday morning at 8.30 a.m., there will be an early morning prayer meeting, Friday morning at 8.30 a.m. These are all the announcements. This is Pentecost Sunday, when we remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the first apostles. And so we begin our service with... Um, Three verses from John's Gospel, chapter 16, where the Lord Jesus says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So let us on this Pentecost Sunday, let us, while remaining seated, praise God, singing Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul.
Please stand for prayer. <clears throat> Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God Almighty, on this Pentecost Sunday, we bow before you, the living God, and we remember with awe and wonder the events of that first Pentecost long ago. We remember how, in the space of a few moments, the experience of the disciples was revolutionized. Their expectations turned upside down. Their attitudes changed forever. One moment consumed by fear, the next radiating confidence. One moment uncertain of the future, the next sure of their calling. One moment wrestling with doubt, the next full of faith. One moment hiding behind closed doors, the next preaching boldly to the crowds. Therefore, mighty God, come afresh to us this day by your Holy Spirit, breathing new fire into our hearts, new energy into our lives, new life into our souls. Even in the days of this pandemic, let us not give way to anxiety or fear, nor yet to isolationist discipleship, but rather embrace again the fellowship of God's people. Transform our fear, anxiety, and doubt, filling us with confidence and faith in your saving and sustaining power. And Lord, since it is the work of your Spirit to bring glory to Jesus, we pray again today that you would take of the things that are Christ's and apply them richly to all our hearts. Lord God, you know us each one standing here in your presence even this day. You know us by name, you know us by our needs. Minister unto us, O Lord, from your word and by the power of your spirit. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Boys and girls, I want to tell you a story today about a wee boy called Tommy. <clears throat> Tommy was in primary school, and Tommy... Tommy had his own way of putting things. Tommy had his own way of saying things. In particular, in particular, he was very fond of the word powerful. He was very fond of the word powerful. Now, 
I want all of you boys and girls, whether you're here in the church building or whether you're in the hall or even at home for that matter, I want all of you and your mums and dads and the adults and all the grown-ups up, grown ups as well, I want all of you to, for a minute or two, to imagine that you are Tommy, okay? You're all Tommy, right? And um, I'm going to say certain things in the way that I might say them, and then on the screen will appear the way that Tommy would say them, right? And when the words appear on the screen that Tommy would say, you all say what Tommy would say. Have you all got that? Right. Okay, so let's, let's try it. I'll say, first of all, just what I might say. Then you'll answer what Tommy would say when, if he was saying kind of the same thing. So here we go. It's a wet day. It's a hot day. It's a windy day. I'm very hungry. Okay, so you get the idea there, uh, what Tommy would say. So, one day, one day an American boy, a wee American boy joined Tommy's class at school. The, yep. Keep that down a minute. Uh, a wee American boy joined Tommy's class at school. And the wee American boy couldn't get his head round uh, how Tommy talked and how Tommy spoke. And the wee American boy, the wee American boy said to Tommy, why do you keep using the word powerful? Why do you keep using the word powerful? And Tommy said to him, do you not know what the word powerful means? And the wee American boy said, no, I don't. And Tommy said, that's right. Boy, that's powerful. So, um, boys and girls, boys and girls and mums and dads and everyone, this is, this is a powerful day. This is a powerful day because this is the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit came in power upon the early disciples. He came, the Holy Spirit came in power upon those early disciples. And um, I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you now a couple of verses which just remind us of that fact. So, in Luke 24 and verse 49, before Jesus was taken up into heaven, he said to his disciples, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He had been crucified for them. He had been raised from the grave. He had appeared to them over a period of time. He was about to be taken up into heaven, but he told them to stay in the city until they had been clothed with power, the power of the Holy Spirit from on high. And then again, in another verse, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we're told this. Jesus said to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So, boys and girls, on this Pentecost Sunday, that's one of the things that we remember, the power of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us power to do various things. The Holy Spirit gives us power to overcome sin. When we trust in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts, the Holy Spirit gives us power to turn away from sin, to overcome sin. And that's why we every day need to say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may overcome sin, that I may turn away from sin in my life. Power to overcome sin. And also, power to witness about the Lord. 
Uh, when the Holy Spirit lives within us, he gives us power by our lives and with our lips to point others to Jesus, the one who can save them. So, power to overcome sin, power to witness for Jesus. So, let's finish um, by saying the words that are on the screen there from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Let's all say this together. After 2, 1, 2. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now let's sing about all of that as we sing together, spirit of holiness, wisdom and faithfulness, wind of the Lord blowing strongly and free. Remaining seated, praising God. It is with regret that we intimate the death of Miss Lillian McKee of Edgar Boyd Court, Carrie Duff, who passed away on Tuesday past. We shall remember all those who mourn her passing now in our prayers of intercession. Heather will lead us in our prayers of intercession. After that, she will read to us the Bible passage for today, which is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. But first of all, our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your care for us over the past months. Thank you that we were able to meet together for prayer on Wednesday night and that COVID restrictions are starting to ease. We thank you that the vaccine rollout has gone as well in our country and that so many people are now protected from the COVID-19 virus. Be with us, Lord, as we start to get back to more normal activities, as we start to mix with more people and go to more places. Help us all to be responsible and not to take undue risks that would cause an increase in infection. Be especially near to those people who have been shielding. Give them confidence to rebuild their lives again. We pray for people and countries around the world who have not yet been able to get access to the vaccine. We think of Nepal and India, where so many people live in poverty, without what we consider the basic necessities of life, such as clean water, food, secure homes and basic health care. 
Please, Lord, prompt the richer countries to help those in need by providing vaccines, food and medicines. We pray for charities and agencies such as Tear Fund, Oxfam and Christian Aid who continue to provide health care under such difficult circumstances. We thank you, Lord, that Egypt has enabled a ceasefire to be agreed between Israel and Palestine. We pray that the ceasefire will hold and that the politicians and people in power will be able to sort out their differences without further loss of life or violence. We think of those who have been recently bereaved, especially the family of Lillian McKee after her death earlier in the week. Comfort them as they come to terms with the loss of their loved one. Help them to look to you, their heavenly father, in the sad times and to remember with joy the happy times they shared. We think of people in our congregation who are ill, in hospital, and those who are waiting test results and treatments. Be with them all, Lord. Give them healing and be with the doctors and nurses who are treating them. We thank you for the National Health Service, for the medical staff who have worked so hard over the past year to help those who were unwell. We pray, Lord, for the community of Carrie Duff and the local churches. Help the churches to be able to connect with people as organisations start to open up again. Give us insight, Lord, as to how to attract new people into our church so that they would learn about you and that many would come to know you as Lord and Saviour. Fill your church, Lord, we pray, and bring salvation to many. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Today's reading is Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. This woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all the want they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Amen. So we continue with our series on Mark's Gospel, considering this morning the passage that was read just now from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. If you were to give these verses a title, then a possible title might be Help for Hurting Parents. Help for Hurting Parents. In Mark chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus, for the first time, stepped out of Israel and stepped onto Gentile territory. He went to the borders of Tyre and Sidon, and those cities were not far from present-day Beirut in Lebanon. And by doing this, by leaving what was recognized as Israel territory and going into Gentile territory, Jesus thereby illustrated that he had come to be the savior of the world, not just the savior of Jews, but the savior of Gentiles as well. Jesus is, of course, a whosoever savior. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. The offer of the gospel is made to all alike, to Jew and Gentile, to the whosoever. So Jesus came into this particular region, and he went into a particular house, and he didn't want anyone actually initially to know that he was there. But the scripture passage says in verse 24, he could not keep his presence secret. He could not keep his presence secret. The presence of Jesus actually can never really be kept hidden. It can never be kept a secret, neither in a church, nor in a home, nor in an individual. 
If Jesus Christ is in your life, then you cannot permanently hide that fact. If you have had an experience with Christ, if he is living in your heart and has changed your life, then the truth will out. And if you belong to him, then of course you, will, you should want the truth to be out. You should want it to be known that he is in your heart, that he is in your home. So this woman then, uh, in this passage, this woman who came to Jesus uh, in these verses is sometimes known as the Syrophoenician woman. Her language was Greek, her nationality Syrophoenician. But above all, above all of that, she was a hurting parent. And in that way, it may be easy for some of us to identify with her. Perhaps some of you in this building today, or some of you following the service at home today, maybe some of you have problems. Maybe some of you have family problems. Maybe some of you have problems with some of your children. Maybe your heart is breaking over some of your children. Because, of course, no godly parent can bring children into this world and be completely free from burdens associated with parenthood. Every parent probably has problems to some degree. Some folks have perhaps especially challenging problems. A rebellious son, a, a difficult daughter, and maybe some parents find themselves almost helpless to do anything to actually change things. A minister called Jerry Vines, in one of his books, says, Before I had children, I had four theories about bringing up children. Now, he says, I have four children and no theories. Well, if you are going through um, maybe some kind of a situation like that, if you are going through burdens with your children, whether they be small children or older children, if that is true of you in your particular situation, then the experience, the experience of this Syrophoenician woman may be able actually to help you. So, first of all, I want you to notice here First of all, a desperate parent. We're told about that in verses 25 and 26. This woman came into the presence of Jesus in desperation. She fell at his feet. She begged him. And when we hear uh, her problem, we can uh, imagine her concern and her anxiety. Because I want you to note here her hurt. Her young daughter had an unclean spirit within her. The term used to describe the little daughter uh, is in fact that little daughter. And this little daughter was no doubt the apple of her mother's eye. She loved that little girl with all her heart. As a mother, she felt great responsibility for the little girl's well-being. But this little girl, we're told, had an unclean spirit within her. Um, or um, an evil spirit can also be translated. And it was, it was an evil spirit in the sense, it, in a kind of a moral sense. An evil spirit, an unclean spirit in a moral kind of a way. Some immorality had taken hold of this girl. It was a frontal attack on her life by the devil. And of course, in our day, we are experiencing a similar situation, are we not? Young people today of various ages, young people today are experiencing a frontal assault on their lives by the demons of hell. The devil is doing everything in his power to get hold of the lives of our children and to 
destroy them. Children are being taught that there is no God, that chance evolution, not divine creation, brought everything into being. And our children are almost subtly being taught that those who believe that God did create everything, that those who believe that are really backward people, benighted people, bigoted people, almost people beneath contempt. Who would believe that kind of thing? That is the subtle suggestion that is being pumped into the minds of our children in all kinds of places. And of course, other things also flow from that. Children of a very tender age are being encouraged to believe that there are no moral boundaries, that there's really no difference between right and wrong, that all kinds, all kinds of relationships, straight, gay, otherwise, all kinds of relationships are normal and acceptable. And in some cases, our children are being encouraged to question their own gender orientation. The vast majority of programs on TV take God's name in vain, and the language is often vulgar. Those programs, which are even described as family viewing, um, often promote sex before marriage and unfaithfulness within marriage as normal and, again, acceptable. Many of the songs on the pop scene are suggestive of lust or of embracing the darkness. There are drugs and alcohol and peer pressure everywhere. And Christian parents are therefore seeing the influence of these things on their children. And they watch on almost at times in desperation. As with this woman then, with hurt in her heart, the devil is doing his best to destroy today's children. That was her hurt. And as I say, if I were a roving reporter going around this congregation or speaking to people in the hall or even speaking to people out in the street, there might be many other parents hurting in the exact same kind of way. But we see not only her hurt, we also see her hope. Because we're told in verse 25, she heard about him. That is, she heard about Jesus. Perhaps she had heard about what Jesus had done for Jairus' daughter, mentioned earlier in Mark's gospel. We've already looked at that passage. Maybe she'd heard what Jesus had done for Jairus' daughter. And maybe she thought to herself, well, if Jesus could do that for Jairus' daughter, maybe Jesus can do something for my daughter. And so she brought her problem to Jesus. And of course, that is the place to bring any problem. It is the place to bring the problem of children who are being led astray by the evil one. So she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. So you see, there's always hope for a child if that child has a praying mother or if that child has a praying father. Parents should often name their children before the throne of grace and claim the blood of Jesus over them. Pray that God will keep them true and strong and faithful to him. Or if they've wandered from the pathway that God will bring them back to him. Or if they've never truly been converted in the first place, that God, the Holy Spirit, would do a work of grace in their hearts. Someone once said that being a parent is one of those jobs that by the time you learn how to do it well, you no longer have the job. 
because by the time you've gained the experience necessary to do it well, in a sense, the children have almost moved on. So, when our children are small, um, you do everything for them that you can. You feed them, you bath them, you dress them, you take them with you wherever you go. But then, of course, they grow. They begin to de develop. They feed themselves. They bath themselves. They dress themselves. They start taking themselves where they want to go. And step by step, you lose a certain amount of influence over your child. And that's the way it's supposed to be, of course. Our children are supposed to develop independence and get to the point when they make their own decisions and organize largely their own life. But sadly, as they develop that independence, sadly, they sometimes also develop independence from God. And they become dismissive. Even if they've been brought up in a Christian home, sometimes they become dismissive of all that they've learned and dismissive of the disciplines that they had been taught as children. And as parents look on, as parents look on in this situation, they feel pained by it. They feel hurt by it. They ask themselves sometimes, where did I go wrong? What should I have done that I didn't do? Did I do something that I ought not to have done? Did I put too much pressure on them? Did I? And they ask themselves endless questions like that. Believe me, I know it to be true within my own heart and within my own life. However, there is still one thing that a Christian parent can do, even if a son or a daughter, even if a son or a daughter um, you know, has reached the point where they scarcely communicate with parents. And that too sometimes happens. But even if that point is reached, there is still one thing Christian parents can do, and that is they can still talk to God about their son or their daughter. They can still, in prayer, bring their son or their daughter, their child, to God in prayer. And that is something that we should never fail to do because the ear of the Lord is always open to the prayers of his people. So here then, in this passage, we see a desperate parent, this woman. We see her hurt and we see her hope because she came. She brought her problem. She brought her need. She brought her situation to Jesus. In the second place, I want you to notice a determined parent. She came to Jesus. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And when she came with this plea, when she came with this plea, Jesus initially gave her a very strange a very intriguing reply. I wonder, did you find that as we read through the passage or in previous times when you've read through this passage, do you find it a strange kind of reply? Jesus said to her, verse 27, first let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. I wonder what that woman initially made of that statement from Jesus. What a strange reply. What was that all about? Well, of course, the Jews sometimes dismissively referred to the Gentiles as dogs. That's how the Jews sometimes referred to the Gentiles. They sometimes dismissively described them as dogs. And remember, this woman was a Gentile from Syrophoenicia. So Jesus was essentially actually seeking to reassure this woman that even though she was not a Jew, she was not a Jew, nor was she a Jewess, but she could still come to him. She was still right 
in coming to him. She still had made the right choice. She did the right thing. Because, of course, we do not come to Jesus through a Jewish door. We do not come to Jesus through a Presbyterian door. We do not come to Jesus through a Pentecostal door or a Methodist door. We come to Jesus only through one door. We come to Jesus through the sinner's door. And that is the only way we get to Jesus. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open. And you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. This woman had no ex- access to Jesus as a Jew. She had no claim upon him in that way, but she could come as a sinner. And when Jesus said this to her, she then said this, yes, Lord, she replied, verse 28, yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. What was she saying? She was saying, you, Jesus, are a Jew. You are the Jewish Messiah. Yes, you have come to save your own people, But you have come not just to save your own people. You have come to save all who will turn to you and call upon your name. And therefore, Lord, I'm willing to accept even the crumbs, the crumbs, Lord, that fall from your table. Lord, I am willing to take whatsoever you offer. She was saying, Lord, I'm willing to come in whatever way you want me to come. I'll get in whatever position I have to get in in order to receive what I so desperately need for my child. And of course, when we are serious enough before God to come in that way, to come in desperation, to be prepared to accept even the crumbs that fall from the Lord's table, when we come in that way, then the Lord will hear, the Lord will answer. Because he that is down need fear no foe. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I'm willing to take, Lord, what you offer. Wouldn't you rather have the crumbs that fall from the master's table than the feast that maybe comes from the devil's table. Which do you prefer? Crumbs from the master's table or rich fare from the devil's table? The devil says, look here, I'm going to give you this and that and the next thing. I'll give you the world. I'll give you fame. I'll give you fortune. I'll give you position. I'll give you this, that, and the next thing if you fall down and worship me, says the evil one. But I repeat, give me the crumbs of Jesus any day. And of course, when we do come to the Lord Jesus, we don't just get crumbs, do we? When we come to the Lord Jesus, he adopts us into his royal family. He makes us who are spiritual orphans, he makes us his own. He adopts us into the family of the king of kings. He seats us at the table. He treats us right royally. We feast upon the good things of the Lord. He brought me into his banqueting house, and his banner over me is love. Yes, here in the second place, we see a determined parent, so determined that she was willing to accept whatever the Lord was willing to give her. And that's the attitude that you and I need to adopt ourselves as we come to the Lord, as we bring our prayers to him, be willing to accept what he gives to us, knowing that he does all things well. 
a desperate parent, a determined parent. And then thirdly, a delighted, a delighted parent. Jesus told her, for such a reply, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. In fact, we're told in the parallel passage in Matthew's gospel, we're told that Jesus also praised her. Woman, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Woman, you have great faith. For such a reply as this, the demon has left your daughter. When she got home, she saw firsthand that the unclean spirit had been taken out of her daughter. Her prayers had been heard. I have heard of godly people. I have heard of godly people who love Jesus and have sought in their own lives and homes to honor him, but nevertheless they have gone through the experience of maybe a rebellious child and they did just what this woman did. They prayed through. They prayed through. They kept seeking the face of God. They kept laying hold of the promises of God. They kept spreading out before him their particular problem, their particular need. And God heard and answered their prayer. So parents, parents don't give up on your children. Keep praying for them. Keep bringing them. You cannot, there comes a stage when if they don't want to, you can't lasso them and drag them into church. You can't do that. But you can still bring them to the Lord in prayer. And you can still pray for wisdom yourself as to how best to witness to them in a, in, in a, in a way that is suitable and appropriate in the situation without seeking to alienate them more and more. Keep praying on. Pray for your grandchildren too. Maybe sometimes grandparents, maybe you're, you have the opportunity to look after grandchildren. Take the opportunity also to say a little word in their ears and into their hearts about the Lord Jesus Christ. So parents, pray through. Don't give up on your children or your grandchildren. And the flip side of that coin, of course, is this. If you are a young man or a young woman who has broken your parents' heart by turning away from the Lord and almost shunning the things of God, then I say to you today, heed your parents' prayers. I say to you today, uh, take note of your parents' concern, of their desire that you might embrace their God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there's a young man or a young woman in this building or perchance listening to this service somewhere, I say to you today, turn to the Lord today. Put no more uh, gray hairs in your mother's head. Put no more anxieties in your father's heart. Heed the gospel. Turn to Christ. Be gloriously saved. And you will then be delighted yourself. And you will also have delighted parents as well. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, we thank you for those in our own homes, our own family circles, and within our congregational family. We thank you, Lord, for those young people who have trusted in Jesus already, who love him, and who are walking in his ways. Help us, Lord, as parents. Help us, Lord, as leaders in this congregation. Help us as responsible Christians in this congregation. Help us, Lord, to do all that we can to encourage such young folk in the things of Christ. 
Heavenly Father, should there be in our own families or in this congregational family, should there be those, Lord, who have um, drifted from the pathway of Christian discipleship, who once knew the Lord but have grown cold and wandered off, Lord, we would pray for such. We pray that you would give us opportunity perhaps to um, speak a word into their ear and encourage them to return again. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be faithful in prayer for such young folk. And Lord, there may be yet other young folk, and they have never yielded to the Lord Jesus at all. They've never come, they've never put their trust in him. Lord, we pray that you would do for them what we cannot do for them, that your Holy Spirit would enlighten their minds and open their hearts and enable them to see they need to embrace Jesus Christ as their Savior. And Heavenly Father, many of us here in this congregation today, many of us, Lord, would thank you for praying parents, parents who in past times not only fed us and loved us and clothed us and did their best for us in all of those ways, but parents who also taught us the word of God and prayed for us. Thank you, Lord, for praying parents. And Lord, for parents here today and grandparents here today, Lord, help us not to lose heart, even in these challenging times, challenging in every way, challenging because of a coronavirus pandemic and a truncated version of church life, and also challenging because of the dark and difficult and morally corrupt times in which we live. Lord, in these days of small things, spiritually speaking, we still pray that you would help us to be faithful in the place of prayer and to pray through. Lord, we leave it all with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wind, wind, blow on me. Wind, wind, set me free. Wind, wind, my Father sent the blessed Holy Spirit. Remaining seated, we praise God.
Please stand for the benediction. <clears throat> May the grace of the lovely Lord Jesus, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the wind of the Holy Spirit blow on us and set us free and enable us to live for you, O God, in these days and in the days to come. And the people of God said, Amen. Please be seated. The stewards will show you out. Right. <clears throat>